Hello, everybody, and welcome to Des Moines University's mini medical school week number four, Does Technology Connect or Isolate Us? by Fritz Nordengren. I am so happy to have you here with us today. My name is Hannah DeGeest, and I am the Community and Public Affairs Manager at Des Moines University, and I am your host for Mini Med School. Um, for those of you who have been tuning in every week, welcome back. And for those of you who are new, um, maybe you've, you're attending Mini Med School for the first time, maybe you're watching this at a later date, um, I still would like to welcome you, and I'm happy that you found us. Um, you don't have to watch all um, of the Mini Med School lectures in a certain order, they can be viewed um, individually if you please. Um, so you're in luck if you've just tuned in for the first time, please stick around and enjoy all that we have to offer you today. So before I introduce um, Fritz and tell you a little bit more about him and his background, I wanted to just share a couple of things about Des Moines University. So again, if you've been here with me every week, you know that every week I've just been sharing um, just a couple of things about DMU just to help you get to know us better um, and just share what we're really about. So one thing at DMU that we are all really looking forward to is our 125th anniversary. So Des Moines University is um, the second oldest osteopathic medical school in the country. And that's something we're very proud of. Of course, we have eight other programs besides the DO program. Um, so we're very proud of those as well, but we are an older institution and we like to think that gives us a lot of experience. So um, we're so happy to be celebrating 125th, 25 years, but we're just even more ecstatic about it because we will be celebrating that on our new campus. Um, we have decided to build a new campus in West Des Moines, which will be all state-of-the-art technology, um, everything really that we need to train the best healthcare providers and health science and medical professionals um, to care for you, me, um, and the rest of our country. So we're just so happy to have the opportunity to be able to do that, um, to train healthcare workers. And um, I cannot wait to be on the new campus and welcome you for tours and be hosting mini med school there. I think it will be such a fun experience. Um, so that's that's my thing I wanted to share with you today about DMU. Um, if you have any questions about our move um, or our new campus, most of those can be probably answered by looking at our website. Um, we do have a page on our website that's dedicated all to the new campus. We even have a live feed going at times that has um, the construction so you can kind of watch it, watch it take place, which I know might not sound super interesting, but I'm telling you, check it out. It's actually really cool. Um, and I'm not a, you know, I'm not super into construction, I would say, but I'm telling you watching these videos, it's kind of interesting because they are turning this, um, you know, piece of land into something just totally different. And so it's kind of cool to see how it all happens. But um, our website, again, is dmu.edu, if you're not already watching on our website, um, where you can check that out. And with no further ado, I will introduce to you Fritz Nordengren. Fritz Nordengren is an award-winning documentary storyteller and digital content strategist. He leads higher education teams and commercial organizations through strategic goal setting, project development, and creative execution using a data-focused approach. He received his Master of Public Health from Des Moines University and has collaborated with education leaders at Mercy College of Health Science and Iowa State University. Fritz was assistant professor at Des Moines University from 2007 to 2014. As a producer and photojournalist, he's documented humanitarian medical relief efforts and has traveled and photographed 21 countries. He's worked for two Nobel Peace Prize nominees, Friendship Force and Minds Adversary Group, and former U.S. President Jimmy Carter's The Carter Foundation. His work has received awards and recognition from USA Today, the National Press Photographers Association, and was twice named one of the top 100 producers in the United States. His photojournalism is represented and distributed internationally by Zumba Press. His family farm is near Winterset, Iowa, where his calendar is run by 15 chickens, four ducks, a goat, a horse, and a dog. 
We are so happy to have Fritz join us today. And I will just say that the reason why we engage with him again, obviously he's not at Des Moines University anymore, um, is because we track every year what are the top hits um, for website articles that we have published. And back in 2010, literally 10 years ago, um, Fritz wrote an article for Des Moines University that was published in our magazine and then we later published online. And it was on this exact topic, does technology connect or isolate us? And in 2020, this article was just blowing up on our website. Everyone was Googling this question. Um, Fritz's article was coming up. People were finding it so engaging. They were sharing it um, with friends and family and all across their um, social platforms and all of that. So um, we noticed it was just getting so much attention. And so we decided to reach out to Fritz and see if he would be interested in presenting for mini med school and possibly doing a little revamp of um, his presentation. And so that is really how we came to have this presentation for you here today. And I really hope that you enjoy it. Good evening, all of you joining us on the Des Moines University Mini Med School live stream, and welcome to those of you who may be joining us after this event. And Hannah, I just want to say thank you for your kind introduction. We're going to have some fun tonight, and we're going to learn. My name is Fritz Nordengren, and as a documentary storyteller, I am constantly engaging in observational research. I observe what people who are in non-experimental situations do when they're confronted with choices. Now, as a journalist, my findings are shared through the images that I make. In my public health work and teaching, we expand that from a look at individual choices to broader community choices. Um, let me oversimplify it, and I hope this hasn't happened to you, but let's pretend that you've had a heart attack. Your heart doctor is concerned with your heart attack. A public health researcher is interested in all the heart attacks in a community. And the community might be the Beaverdale neighborhood, it could be Des Moines, it could be Iowa, the US, maybe the entire world. So the nature of my work has kept me close both to media content and media technology. And our topic tonight is about isolation and connectedness. So as we jump into that, I would like to just touch on some fundamental foundational vocabulary and then also some basic concepts. But once we get past that, I want to look at our question, does technology isolate or connect us? And to explore the question, we're going to look at the world in three different views, and that is how we live, how we love, and how we learn. Now, I don't know any of you personally, but I do know something about you all as an audience. Some of you are retirees. And you're interested not only in your own health, but uh, you have a continuous desire to learn. Others of you are pre-high school and high school students, ready to challenge and change the world, and exploring medicine is a great way to do that. In between are those of you that are in the generations labeled by researchers as Gen Z and Millennials. Well, what we know is the older Gen Z students, you may already be pre-med college majors, and maybe you're looking at medical school options. And for millennials, 2021 is the year that the earliest of your generation turns 40. So now that we all kind of know each other, let's jump in. Let's start with people's basic preferences. How do people think of themselves? Are you familiar with the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the MBTI? It's an assessment, and it's a heavily researched quiz and refinements uh, and studies. But basically, the people who own the rights to that, that assessment say that the MBTI makes the theory of psychological types understandable and useful in people's lives. And two of those types are extroversion and introversion. And we have some ideas about what those mean, but let me explain them from their point of view. They say an extrovert is somebody who might say something like, um, I like getting my energy from active involvement in events, and having a lot of different activities, and I'm excited when I'm around other people, and I like to energize other people. And an introvert, on the other hand, might say, I like getting my energy from dealing with the ideas, pictures, memories, and reactions that are inside my head, in my inner world. I often prefer doing things alone or maybe with one or two people uh, that I feel comfortable with. 
Now, the MBTI is a self-reporting assessment. It looks at those traits and six others that report how you personally think of yourself. It's not a lab measurement like a blood type, and it's not countable like the closing stock market price yesterday. To be honest, we could spend a day learning about extroversion and introversion along with the other MBTI traits, but I'd rather spend a moment outlining what extroversion and introversion are not. Extroversion and introversion have no direct relationship to shyness. Okay? Extroverts can be very shy, and they may not say much, as much as other people uh, you know, around them, but they might enjoy attention, but they may not want to be the center of attention. Likewise, introverts can be very successful public speakers, entertainers. They could be singers performing in giant arenas. Most introverts and extroverts are comfortable and very functional alone or in a large group, but their preferences lean towards one or the other. Okay. And what we know from the data is that introverts and extroverts can be isolated, and it's that isolation that may directly impact their health. Isolation can lead to loneliness, and loneliness is definable and measurable in terms of health outcomes. And it gives us clues about isolation and connectedness. As I began this, I studied the work of John Cassiopo, who was described in his 2018 obituary as a pioneer and founder of the field of social neuroscience, whose research on loneliness helped transform psychology and neuroscience. Wow. In my opinion, his second gift was the ability to make his intelligence and his research accessible. And by that, I mean, it's understandable to all of us and at all experience levels, especially here in our mini med school. Now, certainly the complex neuroscience conversation requires a pretty deep scientific background, but even our eighth grade and ninth, ninth grade scholars who are joining us tonight can learn from Cassiopo. His research is Pretty widely available, his 2008 book titled Loneliness is available online. You can find it at your local bookseller. You can borrow it from the library. I'd show you my copy, but quite frankly, it's the most commonly borrowed book out of my own library. But among other things in the book, you can find out that there's an actual assessment that can identify if you're lonely. It's called the UCLA Loneliness Scale version three. Uh, they've gone through two other versions already. And that's 20 questions and the answers are scored between one and four. But I want to caution you, the quiz is a self-assessment that relies on a trained professional to interpret the results and combine that with the assessments of your life, your medical history. So your score is only part of a larger medical uh, picture of you. So why does it matter? Aren't really, I mean, seriously, aren't we all lonely sometimes? Yeah, you bet we are. We're all lonely sometimes. But if it's an ongoing condition, if it's prevalent in your life all the time, it can have significant health consequences. Maybe you've heard of uh, TED Talks, maybe you've seen them on YouTube, and maybe you've seen their locally organized spinoffs called TEDx. Well, Des Moines had a TEDx in 2013, and Cassiopo was invited to speak there. And so I want to share a clip where he talks about the lethality, the lethal outcomes of loneliness. For living with loneliness, we now know is a major risk factor for broad-based morbidity and mortality. Consider a couple of the conditions we know about premature death. Living with air pollution increases your odds of an early death by 5%. Living with obesity, we know a national health problem, increases your odds of an early death by 20%. Excess of alcohol consumption, 30%. A recent meta-analysis of over 100,000 participants shows that living with loneliness increases your odds of an early death by 45%. 45%. He's talking about a 2010 meta-analysis, which is a study of studies. And depending on which of those studies you look at in, in his meta-analysis, the numbers change a little bit. But loneliness was and is a measurable factor in shortening lifespans. Now, in the 2010 article that I wrote that Hannah shared during her introduction, I mentioned Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone. Now, Putnam is a political scientist. He's not a public health researcher, but 
He studies communities. And so his focus is how does the presence or lack of social capital impact a community? And when he's looking at politics, he's looking at a basic form of community, not politics as conservative or liberal, because we're all part of a community and it's our participation in that community and its decisions that determine social capital. So Putnam's book title is really the simplest way to describe what he was studying. And what he found was that in the last decade of the 1900s, more people were bowling. Yet, bowling league membership was at an all-time low. And that's a great example of the decline in social capital. Now, in healthcare, when we talk about social capital, it really comprises three components. And those components are civic participation, social cohesion, and reciprocity, okay? So an example of civic participation is pretty easy. We can say, do we go to meetings? Do we vote? Those are two examples of what civic participation might look like. Social cohesion is, do we do things together? And what are our emotions about doing the things with the people that we do them with? And if you look at bowling alone, it lacks social cohesion. We're not doing something with somebody else. Now, reciprocity is, do I do things for you and you do things for me? Maybe holding open doors, or maybe it's mowing the grass along the property line between two neighbors, right? It stands to reason that if social capital is low and our engagement with others is low, the potential to go from being connected to isolated to lonely grows as well. And while Cassiopo talks about the chance of premature death, it's not just the chance of death from loneliness and the loss of social capital, but the loss of social capital can actually impact our life in other ways too. Uh, for example, uh, there was a study in Japan that looked at the functional ability of adults and the role of social capital in their functional ability. And functional ability is essentially this. It's the ability to do the normal things of life. Can you dress yourself? Can you bathe yourself? Can you do the shopping? Can you do housework? And it's from a 2019 article. And these researchers looked at 1,900 men 2,200 women from 320 communities. And they studied these folks over a period of just less than four years. So this is a pretty comprehensive study. And, and the quick takeaway is this. Women who participated in community events, civic participation, right, showed higher levels of functional ability than women who did not. And men who perceived that their community's social cohesion was higher also showed improvement in functional ability. Now, social capital is the absence of social isolation, right? But people with a highly functioning social network may be emotionally separated from others. And it's this emotional separation that can lead to loneliness, and the loneliness can lead the human brain to react differently than people who are not emotionally isolated. People who are suffering loneliness typically experience dietary shifts and they tend to eat more fat in their diet. Loneliness in older adults tends to lead to more current stress events and more disputes as sort of their self-defense mechanisms kick in to counter that loneliness. Lonely people tend to withdraw and they tend to seek less help even though they want the help. Stress hormones are increased. Lonely people experience changes in cardiovascular health and their immune system. Cassiopo and others write about this, and it's really a deeper topic than we can cover here in 30 minutes, other than to say the social network in and of itself does not prevent loneliness. In real life, it's the lack of someone to confide in that leads to that emotional isolation and then loneliness. So clearly we need social connections and we need someone to confide in for a healthy life, right? But let's look at the other side of that self-care coin. And on that other side is our inherent need for solitude. What? Let's talk about solitude. One of the foundational scholars of solitude is the late Anthony Storr. And uh, he has a 2000, no, excuse me, 1988 book called Solitude. And it looks here, I'll hold it up a little bit longer. There we go. It looks at artists and scholars um, to understand the value of the time they spend alone. And 
His book takes a look at conventional psychoanalysis. He shares Sigmund Freud's definition of psychological health as the ability to love and work. But he has this to say about it. He says, as a society, we've paid too much attention to love and not enough attention to work. And he says that in terms of where do we get our rewards and connections from. And in a view that's almost the opposite of what we've talked about tonight with loneliness and the work of Cassiopo, Storr sets up the idea that the modern assumption of intimate relationships, or rather that the, the modern assumption of intimate relationships are essential to personal fulfillment, tends to make us neglect the significance of relationships that are not so significant. One of his main premises is intimate attachments are a hub around which a person's life revolves, but it is not necessarily the hub. Now, our entertainment media and culture portray and promote both ideas because we always look at the rugged individualist and then we see the need for a cohesive team of buddies, right? So think of the movies and think of the characters in those movies. You know, think of Keanu Reeves as John Wick. Think about uh, uh, Harrison Ford as Deckard in Blade Runner. Um, Reese Witherspoon when he, in Wild or Numi Rapaz and the girl with the dragon tattoo. And as you think about those, th contrast that with our ensemble cast that we know so well, like Friends or How I Met Your Mother or that 70s show. As I was putting this together, I'm really not sure what to do with The Walking Dead. I mean, Rick Grimes wakes up from a coma and frankly, that's probably about as isolated as you can get, right? But then he and a group of survivors fight off the walking. So maybe that one belongs in both camps. Wouldn't it be amazing to be part of a Zoom call like this? I mean, this would be like the coolest Zoom call in the world. Oh, well. Anyway, in the United States, when we think about solitude, we typically think of Henry David Thoreau. And he comes to mind as an example of his experience at Walden. And he's really sort of the ultimate, escape, ultimate escapist model of individual solitude. And Thoreau built a cabin in the woods. And he lived there and he wrote there for two years. Now, the National Endowment for the Humanities says that during those two years, Thoreau was active in circulating petitions for neighbors in need. He was attentive to what was going on in his community, and he was involved with the Underground Railroad, which sounds a lot like civic engagement, right? And Thoreau himself writes, I had three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for friendship, and three for society. And when visitors came in larger and expected numbers, there was but the third chair for them all. So I think it's a pretty good guess that Thoreau was an introvert, but he contributed to the community social capital. And while we can't say for sure, I'm going to guess he wasn't lonely. Now, scholarship describes both the importance of social connections and the importance of solitude. And with that as a background, now we can start to approach this concept of isolation or connection and we have a common understanding. So one more thing I wanna look at is technology and what has technology done for us lately? You know, certainly the innovation in communication is occurring faster than ever in history. I mean, it took centuries for communication tools to, absolve, uh, to evolve. Um, we had cave paintings, we had early graffiti, you know, Pompeii around the year 79 had all kinds of graffiti. Some of it was lewd, some of it was promotional, a lot of it was political, but, the reproducible communication tools really started with the woodblock printing somewhere around the year 200. We got to movable metal type in the 1440s. Um, Gutenberg's press came about 10 years later, 1450. Uh, Samuel Morse developed a standardized code for the telegraph system in the 1830s, 1840s. And Alexander Bell organized the Bell Telephone Company in the late 17, 1870s. And the challenge with the consumer use of the telephone was why would anyone want one and what would you do with it? So in the early days, one of the business models for this telephone thing was suggested that if you owned a telephone, you could call a number on Friday night and connect to another telephone in the next town over and hear their band concert. Yeah, that didn't catch on. But in the 2000s, Apple developed the iPod, and here was a way you could carry your music with you. And then on January 9th, 2007, at Macworld, Steve Jobs took the stage. 
Today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. It's the cynic in me that says it took us 127 years to get music on the phone. Uh, but we finally got it. So Twitter. Twitter launched in 2006. Instagram came along 2010. Social media began and still looks a little bit like graffiti, um, but there's an essential difference with social media graffiti and the graffiti of Pompeii. The graffiti of Pompeii was physically based. Pliny the Elder was here. It's fixed in a place. Social media graffiti is temporal. It's set in time. Pliny the Elder is now. And so with that in mind, it affects how we interpret it and what it means to us. So let's look at technology and then jump further into our questions. Who's using technology? And on the upside side coin, who's being left out? The disparities of use are really, are they any better? Are they any worse than they were 10 years ago? Um, I reached out and looked at the research from the Pew Research Center, and I like their research because they do high quality research but also their reports are easy to understand. So if you're curious, you can dig in and understand questions that are going on. So let's look at the first gap, gender. There was a 7% gap between men and women's use of the internet in 2000. That gap's essentially gone. It's about, it's essentially equal. There is still a gap between the races and there's a huge gap in terms of how much money you make because the amount of money you make influences how you use or if you use the internet. Pew reports in 2019 that 26% of adults living in households that earn less than $30,000 a year are smartphone dependent internet users. And what that means is they own a smartphone, but they don't have broadband internet in their house. In contrast, only 5% of those living in households earning more than $100,000 a year are in this category. Another gap that still exists is the internet usage gap between urban suburban users and rural adults. And it's the access to broadband high-speed internet. 63% of rural users have home broadband compared to 75 and 79% for urban and suburban folks. Not only is there a significant gap between rural and urban, but there's also a gap between Americans with any form of a disability and Americans with no disability. Just like I mentioned before, 70% of people who have no disability have got access to broadband. Only 57% of those with a disability have access to broadband. So why does that matter? If we're looking from a public health perspective and we're studying communities, then we recognize we have a significant gap in connectivity with rural communities, with disabled persons, black, Asian, and Hispanic communities. So as a public health worker, I'm concerned about that. And now with so many schools using online and distance learning, 
we see why a broadband gap matters. Go to any small town and you're going to find cars parked at the Dairy Queen and in the school parking lot because kids can't do their schoolwork at home. So they drive to the closest Wi-Fi. That's a snapshot of how devices and broadband form uh, the technology that influences us. So how do we live? How do we love? And how do we learn? So how do we live? Let's start with our children, okay? Television is still a thing. Children between the age of zero and two years of age, and this is according to Pew, they surveyed parents, and this is the number of parents who answer, say 74% interact with TV, 35% with a tablet, 49% with a smartphone, 12 with a desktop or laptop, and nine with a gaming device. Now, when we jump to nine to 11 year olds, 91% interact with TV, 78 with tablets, 67% with smartphone, 73% on a desktop or laptop, and 68% have a gaming device. There is social media use uh, by children under age nine, but I wanna look at the nine-year-olds to 11-year-olds. Parents report that 30% of children nine to 11 use TikTok, 22% use Snapchat, 14 use other social media, 11% uh, use Instagram, and 6% are using Facebook. And 67% of nine to 11 year olds have their own cell phone. But 71% of parents surveyed feel the potential harm of smartphones outweighs the potential benefits. And 70% of parents say smartphones will hurt their children's ability to develop healthy friendships and effective social skills. So that isn't just a look at our young children, but it's a glimpse as to what those children as future teenagers and future young adults will have as their experience in the digital communication and their experience with social interactions as they grow older. So as they move into young adults, what do we know? Well, for the first time since the Great Depression, a majority of 18 to 24 year olds live with their parents. At the beginning of the year 2020, it was 47%, but COVID was probably responsible for a quick leap to 52%. So while this may be a COVID related trend, there is a ton of research to be done here, but this change could impact marriage rates, could impact birth rates, and it could potentially change the future of elder care in those families. Now, on the other end of the age spectrum, when we start to look at older adults, we find that Americans age 60 and older spend half their waking hours alone. And in households where the older American lives alone, that time rises to over 10 hours per day all by themselves. The time alone is not a direct cause of the health issues, but it's a measure of social isolation, and we've discussed that earlier, and it can be linked to negative health outcomes. So there's three takeaways from this. Our youngest are using devices frequently. Our new adults have moved back in with their parents, and that could alter for better or worse their social connections, and potentially change their timeline for marriage and children. And the oldest of us are spending most of their waking hours alone. With that said, though, adults generally feel pretty good about their online experience. In 2018, the reports suggested that Americans were more likely to find a connection online than have a negative experience. 71% said they frequently or sometimes see online content that makes them feel connected. But this is interesting. While 73% of Americans say they feel somewhat satisfied with their social life, 54% said they had people in their life they could turn to for support all or most of the time. A third say they don't feel like that all the time. And one in 10 say they never feel like they have someone to turn to for support. That's isolation, and we know that can lead to consequences. So let's say we want someone that we can confide in. Maybe we want that special someone to turn to, right? How do we love in this tech, uh, in this landscape of technology? Okay, let's start with the elephant in the room, right? The cell phone. 51% of Americans in romantic relationships say their partner is often distracted on their phone when they're trying to have a conversation with them. 40% say they're often bothered by the time their partner spends on the phone. And interestingly, 34% say they have looked through their current partner's cell phone without that person's knowledge. 
we're curious. 53% of us have used social media to check up on someone we used to date or be in a relationship with. And yet with all the digital tools and the relative acceptance of their use, 67% of adult people who are dating, adult daters, say their dating life is going, quote, not too well or not at all well. 75% of daters say it is, quote, very or somewhat difficult to find people to date in the last year. Now, this probably has some results of socialization, socialization, social isolation, there we go, and COVID restrictions. But it's still something for us to be aware of, and it starts to give us some insight into those technology influences. And now we return to how we learn. That was a topic that was at the heart of my 2010 blog post. And in light of COVID, it brings new challenges and opportunities. What we know so far about parents' views about learning is this. Parents of children attending school fully in person are much more likely to be satisfied and less likely to be concerned with their child's educational outcomes uh, in 2020. 54% of the in-person parents describe themselves as very satisfied versus 29% of the parents whose children have some online education. And that's their satisfaction feeling that is not looking at how children have actually performed. The learning style gap grows across the income levels. 53% of lower income families report their children are receiving online instruction only as compared to 40% of higher income families. And we know lower income and rural families have the least access to broadband and are the most common to have online only instruction. So the largest group getting fully online instruction has the lowest access to broadband. If you're a researcher, this is gonna be a research area that will be amazingly important to study as we go forward. So here we are. We've seen and measured the preferences. We've looked at the technology we use over the last 10 years. We've looked at an overview of research on how we live, how we love, and how we learn. So with that said, let me ask you the question, does technology isolate us or connect us? My answer, it's yes, it does both. And we're gonna to continue to see the successes and the missed opportunities. Our, our failure, if, if we're going to have one, will be if we don't learn from the things we dislike and we don't reinforce the things we do like. Our areas of concern need to continue to be the vulnerable and the underrepresented. The impact of loneliness in older adults, the use of smartphones at younger ages, the shifting challenges of young adults living at home and dating becoming harder are the things we need to talk about, that we need to address and we need to resolve as individuals, as families and communities. I don't know the answers, but I do know the conversations that need to happen. So here's three ideas to help us move ahead independently and collectively. If right now you feel like you're overconnected, you can't keep up with social media and you're feeling the loss of connection to the people who matter the most to you, I'm gonna suggest you look at Cal Newport's book called Digital Minimalism. And Newport suggests a digital declutter. He says, take 30 days off, just turn them all off. Explain to your closest friends, hey, you're just taking a break, you're not trying to make a statement or anything. But at the end of that 30 days, reflect and look at those media and channels that are the most useful and add those back in. You know, Don't just walk away from everything, but bring back the ones that matter the most and ignore the rest. Second thing I'll suggest is take a lesson from store and learn to welcome and grasp the help of solitude in your life. Your need for solitude may not be the same as the person sitting next to you or, or the person in the next block, but solitude nevertheless is important to include in your life. If you are parents and you're looking at the ever-growing digital overload, it's time maybe to take advantage of the good and the bad and put them together. So instead of banning smartphones at the dinner table, why not just demand that everybody bring their phone and be ready to talk about something that they saw or in interacted with online today? Uh, if you're a competitive family, heck, make it a contest, right? If you're a funny family, just everybody goes out and seeks the goofy things. If you're a parent of a teen, 
Um, talk with them about the words and the slang that you used as a kid. And I know they're going to look at you and think you're weird. That's part of the plan. But it gives them a door to open up and talk about some of the things that are happening in their lives or some of the things that they see are inappropriate or make them feel uncomfortable on the web. It opens a chance to talk about your own family, your values, why you do or do not do certain things or why you act certain ways. Um, maybe you just have everybody bring a news story, a sports story, an entertainment story to the table to start the conversation and to keep it going. Now, this isn't a one size fits all answer because we don't all have one size fits all families, but it's a start. And lastly, if you feel isolated and you feel alone, it's time to reach out and talk to someone. Call, text, talk, knock on a door. Okay, you wear a mask, you stand a few feet apart, but knock on a door. And you don't have to tell them your whole life story. Just start small. Listen, ask questions, share about yourself, and appreciate what they share about themselves. You know, it's very difficult with social distancing right now, limited movement, but just getting started is going to help you make a difference. And if you're having trouble with your daily function, if you can't get out of bed, if you're not getting dressed, if you don't shop right, if you're not taking a bath, it's time to reach out for some professional help and counseling. Uh, it's difficult, but it will help and it will make a lot of change in your life. So as we wrap up, I'd like to share a quote, and it's often attributed as an African proverb. It's in the beginning of Cassiopo's book. It was quoted by Senator Cory Booker at the uh, 2016 Democrat Convention. And, you know, we mentioned Walking Dead. It actually appears written on a note in Season 9, Episode 4 of The Walking Dead. It may or may not be of African origin, but it serves as a great capstone to what we've talked about tonight. If you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Fritz, for joining us and sharing all of that interesting um, information. That was so cool. I hope you guys all enjoyed it just as much as I did. Um, if you have questions, please, please send them in to me. I'm looking forward to reading um, what you guys are thinking and what your questions are. So send those to questions at dmu.edu and I will place that email address on the screen right after this so you can see it in writing. Um, and I, of course, will challenge you now um, to think of one thing that you learned today. What was the most interesting, cool thing um, that you heard presented and share it with one other person, whether um, that's a friend, a family member, a colleague, um, maybe it's your teacher. Um, just tell them about um, something cool that you learned in this presentation. Um, I personally can think of a ton of things that I want to share with people that I know. Um, so I hope you will join us next week, um, March 2nd. We will have our last and final mini med school lecture for this series. Um, Dr. Sarah Parrott will be joining us. She is the chair of the Des Moines University Family and Internal Medicine Department. Um, and she is going to be presenting on why every person needs an annual wellness exam. I think it's going to be really informative um, for all of you interested in wellness and taking care of your bodies in the best way that we can. Um, and I hope to see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye.